we decided to open our, our first salon. It was 1993. It was a very tiny place, very small, and uh, there was just the four of us and a big dream. We had no money. We had to sell this very old, beaten up beetle car. That's how we began. Bom dia, gente. Leila Velez and her partners spent years developing a formula to take the frizz out of hair. When they perfected it, it was an instant hit. It took only a few months to have a lot of people trying to have the same solution because they saw our hair and said, wow, your hair looks different, I want the same thing for me. In no time, they, they were bringing family and uh, friends, and in about six months, we had these huge lineups waiting for, for the treatments. Brazilians of African descent make up half the population, and until Layla came along, there wasn't a lot they could do with their troublesome curly locks. Her Instituto Beleza Natural is now a $30 million business. Finally, because it's so clear for us, have this huge market potential, and due to all the problems that we had in our economy and political and everything else, bureaucracy, it was like a huge wall. Nobody saw us. They saw us, in, I think, in a wrong perspective. And nowadays, it's, it's really different. It is different, and in a relatively short space of time. Very different from when the military ruled, when speaking your mind was a risk, and when inflation was running at 2% a day. I remember when I was a kid, I had to go to the market to buy a lot of um, beans for my family because the next day the price would be twice or three times just because of the hyperinflation. Like Layla's frizzy-haired clientele, Brazil too has had a stunning makeover. When most people think of Brazil, they conjure up the usual cliches, the football, the music and the beach. But while the rest of us have been distracted by the fancy footwork and the beautiful bodies, Brazil has quietly become an economic superpower. It's poised to become the fifth biggest economy in the world, and it's a transformation that's been so swift, the country itself has been struggling to keep up. It's hard to hear much about Brazil's growing pains here for all the upbeat banter and the popping of corks. The champagne is flowing for the movers and shakers of Brazilian business and investment. Eduardo Paez, the mayor of Rio de Janeiro, is selling his city. I mean, it's a sexy city, charming city. I'll say it's the best place in South America or uh, Southern Hemisphere, together with Australia, uh, <laughs> the best place to live and work. It's a great time to be running Rio. The city will host many of the World Cup soccer fixtures in 2014, and barely have time to shake the hangover off before the Olympics arrive in 2016. I think it's the Brazilian moment. And it's a rich, fantastic country uh, that has always been in, in our history. We've always been, you know, like, we're going to be the country of the future. This future would never come. I think we're there. But it's going to take some fancy political footwork to ensure the cup, the games, and Brazil's sizzling economy don't become an explosive cocktail. Era um desafio que só com uma disposição olímpica nós poderíamos uh, superar. The lesson that I learned from Maragall, which was the mayor of Barcelona, he told me, I mean, there are two kind of Olympic games. You know, the one that uses the city, the other kind is the, the, the city that uses the Olympic Games. Barcelona did the second way, and we're going to do the second way. Valeu, gente.
if you look for the experience of Athens, it was very bad for Athens. If you look uh, for the Montreal experience, they're paying the debts until now. Depends on how you do the thing. At 70, Fernando Gabiera has seen a great deal of the dramatic economic and political shifts in his country. A one-time firebrand who was a part of the armed resistance to the military dictatorship, he's a highly respected elder statesman who only narrowly missed out on the mayor's job. Of course, we did our job. We overcome the dictatorship. Now we are a democracy. Not a perfect democracy, but we are just improving. It's fair to say he's mellowed over time, but he's still got a sharp eye for injustice and the pitfalls of Brazil's boom time. Thousands and millions of people came to the big cities and they concentrated in the Brazilian metropolitan areas. And we are not able to give them what they deserve, transportation, uh, sanitation, education, and security. And this is one of the most important social consequences of this uh, growing. There may be growing pains, but the growth has propelled so many people up the social and economic ladder that not too many in Brazil feel any nostalgia for the past. We cannot miss the space now. Uh, this is something that we need to follow, you know, every day, uh, be very transparent, charge us ourselves, you know, uh, look forward to make the changes that the country needs. But it's a big problem with infrastructure, the social differences. The economic rise has been fast, frenetic, but the economy is a bullet train, and much of the country still runs on the old single gauge. It's impossible to ignore the fact that Rio is still a divided place. The favelas, the old slums, topple from the hills and wedge right up against the glitzy neighbourhoods of the well-to-do. The drug gangs in the favelas made this one of the most dangerous cities in the world. <laughs> 